I'm Diane Moore, and I am the uh, director of the Religious Literacy Project, and on the faculty here, uh, a senior scholar at the Center for the Study of World Religions, and uh, a lecturer in Religion, Conflict, and Peace. On behalf of my colleagues who are the co-conveners of this entire Religious Literacy in the Professions Initiative, Steve Prothero from Boston University, our Dean David Hempton, Sarah Levy Brightman, who you'll hear from momentarily, uh, and Lauren Kirby, who have helped uh, together shape this entire initiative where we look at the roles that uh, religions play in society through the lens of professions. And we've been able to gather professionals from a variety of fields, journalism in our first one, humanitarian aid and action in our second, government in our third, and here we are in our fourth and final symposium on uh, religion and media and entertainment. Our funder for this entire series, Bruce McGever, is not able to be with us today, but we're so grateful to him uh, for his benefactor, as a benefactor and as someone who helped shape this, uh, this opportunity for us. So I want to welcome all of you who are here, uh, who are here for, this, for the second day, who, those of you in the audience and online who were, had the incredible privilege of being here last night to hear Abigail Disney's remarkable comments. Um, and for those of you who weren't able to hear her, I encourage you to take a look online and watch uh, the framing that she offered us for our conversations today. So I want to say a quick word about um, what Abigail uh, invited our consideration of. She, she gave us so many themes, and I really look forward and hope that many of our conversations and panelists today will, will draw upon her themes. But the one that I wanted to, uh, to highlight, so, so Abigail Disney's a um, acclaimed documentary filmmaker. And one of her comments that she made was she said that documentary films are often shaped by an exclamation point. And she wanted to create documentary films that were shaped around and inspired by a question mark. And I think that is a really, really rich way to think about our work. Because I think we in the academy, and you as media uh, professionals, actually both of us are in the business of knowledge production and dissemination with different audiences and different uh, genres, of course. But with that notion of that we are all in this business of, again, knowledge, production, and dissemination, I invite all of us here to reflect upon whether our own work and contributions are shaped by exclamation points that simplistically reproduce stereotypes and single stories, or by question marks that disrupt assumptions in ways that inspire curiosity to learn more. So here, re regarding media and entertainment, the questions about religion are widespread. The single story about religion is very prominent in our culture. I used to uh, do an exercise at the beginning of many of my classes where I'd ask my students um, to literally have five seconds to just conjure up and then jot down a word or two to remind them when I, to what images or ideas or representations come to mind when I say these terms. And I'll say Islam or Muslim or Buddhist or Christian. Everyone always had readily at hand a particular kind of representation and they were almost always uniform. And then the invitation then to ponder, now what do you, you actually think or know or think you know about these categories? Of course, we get into a very different kind of more nuanced, but sometimes, unfortunately, not as nuanced as we'd like description. So it's just a very sh short snapshot of the ways that a single story of religion permeates our cultures, religion in general, and I think particular religions and the nature of what it means to be re responsible producers of and disseminators of knowledge seems to me to uh, invite the complex, to, to, make, uh, to make those single stories more complex and invite the opportunity to think about that. So here, when we think about media and entertainment and religion, a quick survey of recent notable TV shows reveals the marked presence of religion 
from Game of Thrones to Westworld, transparent to the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, from the leftovers to the handmaiden's tale, from homeland to the good place. Popular movies also expose audiences to both religions and religious themes. From the Coen brothers' Hail Caesar to Marvel's Avengers, Avengers series, so that's one I don't watch, which is why I tripped over it, sorry. Marvel's <laughs> Avengers series, from lyric uh, meditations on coming of age, such as Call Me By Your Name, and to the current panoply of apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic films, religion is almost always everywhere you turn. And our panels today include an incredible mix of media professionals, consultants, and scholars. Each one explores the work of media and entertainment from a different angle. And I just want to say thank you again to all the participants of the symposium who are here, uh, taking time out of phenomenally busy schedules to be with us. And it is our incredible privilege to host you. And we're very much looking forward to the contributions today in these conversations. Panel one, which you're about ready to hear, will be moderated by Sarah Ben Levy Brightman and explores how scholars and media professionals think about the impact of media. I'll be moderating panel two, where we'll be exploring what critics and scholars think about the coverage or use of religion in contemporary films and TV. Panel three will be moderated by Steve Prothero and explores the various pressures that affect how religion is depicted or used from the sense of a story to the pressures of marketing to the interests of investors. And panel four will be moderated by Lauren Kirby and explores the possibility of using media-based corporate social responsibility campaigns to promote better religious literacy. And finally, before I turn this over, I just want to again thank Mario Cater Fresh, who will also be uh, speaking on one of our panels today for his really critical role in helping us shape the entire media and entertainment uh, symposium. So thank you all again for being with us, and I'll turn it over to you, Sarah Ben, and the panel. Thank you. Good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, there's something wonderful about having a job in which you get to frame out a problem and then invite other people to come and solve it. Um, so having spent months working um, with my colleagues at the RLP, thinking through these issues, it's really exciting to be here today to be able to uh, listen to um, the conversations that will unfold. Um, this first panel, as Diane just mentioned, treads sort of at the edge of media studies and media effects theory. It begins with the assumption that drives this whole symposium, namely that most of us spend a tremendous amount and perhaps an inordinate amount of time watching, consuming, immersed in, interacting with, enfolded in media. I think the fact that I don't even know what word to use to describe our relationship to media identifies the problem we're very hard pressed to understand or explain how media shapes us. Given that the Religious Literacy Project is explicitly interested in the possibility of using media to promote better public literacy with respect to religion, the question of how media affects us is paramount. To that end, we have gathered a number of people representing the academy, journalism, and media to reflect from different angles on how media affects us. Circulating in this air, an air that feels both quotidian because these are things we just do every day, and rarefied because making sense of it all is actually extremely complicated and slippery, are a series of key questions. How are scholars and media professionals thinking about the effects of our immersion in media? How does media shape how people see who they are? How does media function to create social groups? In what ways do the effective qualities of various genres, drama, comedy, reality TV, shape and change how viewers experience and respond to the world around them? What role does media play in shaping how cultural subgroups perceive and interact with each other? and with dominant culture? How can media be harnessed to affect positive changes in perception and behavior? Are certain forms of media and genres of narrative particularly effective at changing beliefs and behaviors? And if so, why? And how does that work? 
And how do scholars of contemporary religion think about the relationship between religion and media in shaping culture? This last question is particularly salient given our context. We are, after all, having this conversation in a divinity school, and a number of our speakers, both on this panel and others, are scholars of religion. What if particular aid or insight might scholars of religion bring to this conversation? Do years of training and practice exploring the power of text and the force of ritual to form us offer scholars of religion a particularly insightful vantage point from which to enter into a conversation about the power of media to shape us and the way media might be harnessed to improve public religious literacy? And conversely, what can and must scholars of religion interested in media learn from other areas of scholarship, especially communications, as well as from media professionals themselves. We have five panelists on this first panel today running, an, I think, a very interesting gamut. Our first panelist, Joanna Piacenza, is a business journalist. She has an academic background in religion and media studies. But Joanna will not only be kicking off this panel, in truth, she's really kicking off the symposium. For she brings us fresh data called from a national survey her outfit, Morning Consult, has just completed for us, which looks at the public's exposure to religion via media viewership. No one has heard what she has to say. It hasn't been published yet. I haven't heard the results yet. So this really is a fresh take. Um, Joanna will be followed by Christopher White, Professor and Chair of Religion at Vassar College. Chris will orient us with a brief overview of media effects theory and reflect on its relevance for thinking about religion in the media. Following Chris is Professor Sheila Murphy, who joins us from the Annenberg School of Cal Communications at USC, where part of her work explores the use of stories or narratives to change belief and behaviors. One of the interesting themes that emerged over the course of doing the research for this symposium was the degree to which work being done in other areas, especially public health, appears particularly relevant um, for thinking about supporting better religious literacy in the, in, among the public. And um, Sheila's work will really, I think, bring that home. Mick Moore is the principal and founder of Morn Associates, a creative agency in New York City that specializes in media campaigns designed to shift culture. Mick and his team are the people who brought you, if you were around for Barack Obama's two elections and recall them, Sarah Silverman's Great Schlep in 2008 and Samuel Jackson's Wake the Fuck Up in 2012. <laughs> and more recently, Halal and the Family, a spoof of All in the Family, with the comedian Asif Man Manvi replacing Carol O'Connor's Archie Bunker. Today, Mick will reflect on how he and his organization think about the power of media, and particularly the role of humor in shaping and changing culture. Lastly, we will hear from Professor Jonathan Jackson, Jr., Dean of the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania. John's work has focused significantly on the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem, a group of mostly African American expats based in Israel, but with satellite communities all around the world. Here, he will reflect on what we can learn from this global community's use of media, and particularly how its representation of black religiosity helps us better understand how media works to form and transform communities. After our panelists have spoken, we will give them a chance to engage each other, and then if we have time, we will open for questions from the audience. So I turn this over to Joanna. Um, please forgive the sniffles. My fall allergies have decided to join me this weekend. Um, so as Sarah Bin said, uh, thank you so much for having me. First of all, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm a business reporter for Morning Consult, um, but as you mentioned, I have an academic and professional background in religious studies. So when I heard about this symposium, I thought it was a dream. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to release some data and talk about it and try to give some context. Um, but what I'm hoping is that these data points um, you know, aren't kind of the end of the sentence, but the beginning of some really interesting conversations on this panel um, and throughout the day. 
so a couple things about survey building and survey design. Um, I think it's really important to understand the questions that we were trying to answer when um, we built the survey, when I wrote it. And the main question was, how much do people experience other religions, religions that are not their own, um, in the media, in entertainment? Um, in order to do that, we needed some sort of comparative. Oh, let's start here. We needed some sort of comparative. Um, so what we asked is how often do you consume a religion that's not your own um, in entertainment, but also how much do you consume it in real life? So when we ask things like, how often do you see a ritual on television from a religion that's not your own? We also asked how often do you participate in rituals um, that are not your own from a religion that's not your own in real life? Um, so the survey breaks down largely into four different parts experiencing ritual in real life and experiencing it in entertainment and media and experiencing people um, in real life and experiencing people in the media. And also we ask perceptions of how these uh, religions are portrayed, which is very interesting, which are kind of the last two slides. So a lot of this data will kind of confirm assumptions that we have um, about how religion is portrayed in the media. Um, but some of it's really interesting, and as someone that stares at data all day long, um, I found this very interesting, so I hope you do too. Um, if anyone is interested in looking at this data for themselves, um, I'm more than happy to share the PDF um, with, with anybody who wants it. It is 350 pages, um, so it, read it as you'd like. Um, so the first, the first kind of takeaway that I wanted to share here is that a relatively small amount of people um, have participated in rituals outside of their own religious tradition. This is in the past year. We asked folks, how often have you participated in a ritual or ceremony from a religion that's not your own? Only 16% said yes. It's slightly higher among Gen Z. That's age 18 to 21 for us because we only poll on adults over um, age 18. Um, but there's no real difference anywhere else. I looked at party breaks, community breaks, um, different subgroups, um, and there wasn't a lot of difference. Now, when you look at uh, how people consume media, uh, how people consume other religions in the media, that number doubles. 34% uh, said that they have seen a religious ritual that's not their own portrayed in the media. Now, if that seems low to you, only a, a third have seen some sort of uh, representation of religion that's not their own in the entertainment industry in the last year. You're probably right. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, the, the best I can guess is that when people see religion in the entertainment industry, unless it's very obvious, they don't really take note of it. Um, the second reason is that consumers have really short memories, and I see that a lot with data. We'll pull on something that happened a week ago, two weeks ago, and a lot of people fall into the don't know, no opinion category because they don't remember that happening. Um, Let's see, so what we can take from that, oh, sorry, excuse me, what we can take from that is that more people are getting their information about other religions from the media and from the entertainment, which is something that we kind of all knew, um, but now we can actually put a number on that and we can say that people are twice as likely to experience other religions in the media, which um, gives a lot of credit to the conversations that we're having today. Let's see here. Um, when we ask folks, give me one moment. Uh, when we asked folks what type of religious tradition uh, they saw represented in the media, these were the answers that we got. Now keep in mind that the country is 70% Christian about, um, so when we asked what religious tradition did you see portrayed um, that's not your own, they're going to go with something else besides Christianity. Um, so the, the two numbers here that stuck out the most to me were Judaism and Islam. Those were the top two um, for people saying that they had, ex had seen some sort of representation of that, uh, of that faith or that religion outside of their own. Um, what's important to remember here is that um, I think Jews make up 1.6% of the population and Muslims make up 0.9% of the population. Um, so there could be a couple things going on. One is that Jews and Muslims are overrepresented in the media in some way. Or it could also be that people's memory of those representations stick for some reason um, because of uh, certain political or, or social reasons. Um, let's see. Forgive me. <coughs> So 
So one of the other questions that we asked um, was if you knew someone that was who was Muslim or if uh, you had seen the entertainment por industry portray someone who was Muslim. Folks were twice as likely to say that they had seen a representation of someone who is Muslim and actually uh, know someone uh, that, that followed that faith. Um, among Christians, it's even higher, and among white evangelicals, uh, that, that gap grows even more. Um, an important thing to keep in mind here is that uh, interaction um, breeds understanding, and I think all of us understand that, but there's actually data to prove it, of course. Um, and uh, this was from a PRI poll. 8% of people said that they interact with someone who is Muslim every day, but most people, it was around two thirds in the 60s, say that they seldom or never interact with someone who is Muslim. Now among those people that interact with someone daily or occasionally that follows Islam, um, they agreed more with the statement, Muslim Americans are an important part of the religious demography of the US, and they were also more likely to be supportive of Syrian refugees coming to the US. So another thing to, to remember about that last uh, chart was that we don't see that sort of doubling with any other faith. We asked um, about uh, all of these religions, all these religious traditions, and for Islam it was the only one where that sort of gap existed. We saw it a little bit with um, Judaism, or Judaism, but we didn't see it um, with any other faith. Let's see. Um, so for this, sorry, give me one second. Uh, so when it comes to how these uh, religions are portrayed, uh, Americans largely uh, are in agreement about two different groups, uh, Christianity and Islam. So up until this point, we've, we've been asking people kind of objective questions. How many times have you seen this religion portrayed? How many people do you know that are this faith? Um, how many times have you participated in ritual? How many times have you seen this character on TV? Now, for the first time, we're asking perceptions. We're asking people to gauge um, what they think about these portrayals, if they think they're positive, if they think they're negative. So this sort of data should be kind of observed in a different way um, than the first part of the survey. So this is all perceptions, which is still very interesting, um, but we need to look at it in a different way than we did the first. Um, and as you can see, 40% uh, believe that Christianity is, is shown positively, and 36% believe that uh, Islam is shown in a negative way. Now, where things get interesting is when we look at party breaks or political party breaks. And as someone who lives in DC, I always like to look at uh, political party breaks because I think tribalism is at its highest right now. And I think that um, party ID is a very interesting thing to look at. Now, when you look at Islam, you'll see that Republicans and Democrats are in agreement in how the, that, the, that the religion is portrayed in a negative way. 39% believe that the religion is portrayed negatively. But when you look at Christianity, uh, Republicans are three times as likely, about three times as likely, um, to say that Christianity is portrayed negatively in the media. And this reminded me of things that Abigail, Abigail was saying yesterday about um, how conservatives believe that Christianity is being viewed not only by the people around them, but by people in the media. Um, let's see. And one more point, on average, Republicans are more likely to say all religion is treated more negatively than positively, and it's the opposite for Democrats. So what it is, they took uh, the average of all these by party <coughs> breaks, and Republicans are more likely to say that religion overall is seen in a negative way. Um, Democrats, uh, it's the opposite for them. Um, so one last thing to close on, uh, as someone that does polling, um, uh, I, I'm constantly reminded that I should be humble about my data. Um, this is one survey, uh, it's a really interesting one, and I hope you think it's interesting as well, and I think you could get a lot of insights from it. Um, but this is just one portion of a larger story, and again, I hope these numbers aren't taken on their face value and, you know, the end of a sentence, but I hope that they, they spark some really interesting conversation about why these things exist, why this is. There are lots of different ways to go about this, and, and this is one of them, and I hope we can kind of have a conversation about, about these answers. Thank you. Okay, the most exciting the most exciting thing about my remarks today are that it that it's done on a Prezi it's a Prezi slideshow, which 
You know, I, uh, I give, <laughs> I give, uh, I give crummy, low-tech uh, slideshows to my religion, media, and pop culture class. And last week, I had one of my senior film majors come up to me and say, hey, you know what? Why don't you do something on Prezi? I, you know, he knew I, I was coming to this conference. Actually, I invited some of my students to come. And he said, I'll, I'll do it for you. I'll come to your office. We'll put it together. So he put together this whole slideshow for me. Everything like whizzes around, and it moves. And uh, so hopefully, I won't go too fast, and, and you won't get dizzy from watching things like fly in and fly out. But, um, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, my name is Chris White. I'm from Bastard College. I'm really pleased to be here today to have a sort of an interdisciplinary conversation that I don't often get to have, actually, about religion uh, and contemporary America and media and pop culture. Uh, Sarah Ben asked me to talk about media effects theory and to give an overview of media effects theory. Remember we, remember we had a phone conversation about this. And then also talk about the American religious and spiritual landscape. And I, and I said, well, how, how long do I have to do that? She said, oh, 10 minutes, you know, 10 or, 10, 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. And I said, okay, and we got off the phone. And, and then I thought about it for about 10 or 15 minutes. I said, wait a minute, how am I going to talk about media <laughs> effects theory yeah. and the American religious landscape in 10 minutes? So I hope it's okay with you. I'm going to talk for 45 minutes. Is that okay? <laughs> Please, can we go ahead and do that? No, so, so what I did was I, I went ahead and did a very selective um, cut through of uh, this is sort of like Chris's favorite media effects theories, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is sort of uh, the media effects theories that have been most useful and helpful to me as I think about the uh, changing religious landscape in America. So I'm going to start with a couple of media effects theories and then, and then talk a little bit about spirituality in mo modern America and maybe the ways in which uh, media messages or images are reshaping um, the contemporary spiritual environment. So check out this check out this Prezi these Prezi slides, huh? Wow. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna begin. <coughs> if I can figure this out. Okay, I want to begin. I want to begin with a scary example. Yeah, I want to begin with a, a rather dramatic example of of media effects uh, and the power of media to affect people, and that's the reception of the 1973 supernatural horror film, The Exorcist. After the film opened, there were a lot of news reports in the US um, about how people were disturbed when watching the film, that audience members uh, reported vomiting in the film, that audience members ran out of the film terrified, and that some audience members were convinced that they themselves were possessed by demons. So uh, these kind of reports were rare, but they were, they were, uh, you know, they were they were there, right? They were there in the news media, and they were prominent enough to cause a lot of alarm about direct media effects. And they even led to the British Board of Film Classification to banning the movie in 1973. So I'm starting with The Exorcist because I think it's a good place to start as we think about, you know, how do media images affect us? Why do media messages um, affect us? Do they affect us this directly, right? The Exorcist is sort of uh, offers this dramatic example. Do they affect us this directly? Most media studies people will say no, <laughs> okay? Uh, most media studies people today talk about the many ways that uh, media ideas and images and messages are, are, are indirect. Um, if they, they affect us based on a whole host of factors that have to do with a number of things like what is the content of the media? What type of media are we using? And, and really above all, you know, who was who in the audience? Right? What, what, what culture, um, what race, what gender, what are the audience's pre-existing beliefs and biases? Um, what are their needs? Uh, what are their interests? So today, uh, most media studies people talk about the indirect effects of media images and they introduce all of these factors. Now, when I first started looking into this, I actually I have a slide here, which is, uh, which is sort of a screenshot. This is what you get when you Google media effects theory, right? It's like this crazy quilt of thousands of different theories, right? There are, there's an army of media studies people and communication studies people and social psychologists who study the effects of media on folks, right? And putting in play all kinds of these variables that I, that I already discussed. This slide is really here just so you'll feel sorry for me that I had to make sense of all this. <laughs> so, like I said, I've chosen just a couple that I wanted to talk about, just a couple of um, media effects theories that 
are helping me actually think about some of the issues I think about. I teach and write about technology, spirituality, and the changing American religious landscape. And so the, the first set of theories I wanted to talk about were active audience type theories. So uh, with the exorcist example of people feeling possessed or running from the theater terrified or vomiting, those are examples of, wow, it seems like just the film just kind of uh, sends like a laser beam right, right into your brain and changes you. Right? That's not really how, how things work. Uh, that's really a model of a passive audience. And nowadays, uh, most people talk about active audiences. All right, so the ways that active, uh, audience members are active, they're engaged, they're critical, they're selecting their media, right? They're thinking about their media. Uh, one consequence of this is that producers of the media uh, need to be aware of what audience uh, members' needs are, what their culture is, what their personality characteristics are, their desires, their wishes, um, and so on. Some have used these types of theories to explain, for instance, the astonishing rise of like supernatural television. All right, so I have a couple of examples. Oops, something, there it's back, okay. Uh, my presentation is possessed. Um, some, have, some have used these types of theories to talk about why certain shows take off, right? Like uh, supernatural shows like Buffy, right? These, these cult shows, the supernatural, Stranger Things. Uh, and one, one way of thinking about this is that these shows really Speak to, uh, speak to audience members' questions. Their questions about meaning, about transcendence, in a culture in which people are withdrawing from traditional religion. Some scholars have actually made this argument. All right, so these are arguments about why media messages are powerful and why they, why they shape people based on um, uh, what audience members need. There's another set of views called symbolic interaction, interactionist views. This is the idea that um, rather than talking about media effects as something that exists outside of culture, that comes into culture and shapes us, that, that media is uh, it's enmeshed in the webs of culture. All right? that, and that, in fact, media is actually the source of many of the ideas and symbols um, that, that make up, that constitute culture. All right? the, the theory is similar to sociological studies and studies actually in religious studies that talk about the ways that people assemble a sense of meaning and assemble a sac sacred cosmos, not just based on their participation in church or synagogue, but based on a whole host of other things, right? Things that they see um, in media, things that they experience in, uh, when they watch pop science documentaries, uh, and so on. So there's a whole, there's a whole network of symbols um, and values that people are getting um, uh, through culture and especially through media. Other scholars have pointed out, as I say here at the end, the, uh, the last point here, that it's really electronic media, rather than, for example, the Bible, that provides our set of common narratives and symbols. In 1900 and 1850, the Bible actually was the sort of source of our common stories and common narratives. People were biblically literate in a way that they're not now. Many media studies folks and religious studies folks now point to television, um, and uh, uh, social media platforms, other sorts of mass media as the source of our common uh, symbolic life. Okay, and then there's a, a bunch of theories that I'm calling theories of immersion and absorption. Theories that state, that talk about, you know, the ways that rich media environments can powerfully influence attitudes and beliefs. Um, that media messages and images are more influential if they are reinforced in uh, in different media platforms. And here uh, we could think about um, multi-platform media franchises like Star Wars or Harry Potter. I know that in my family, uh, we all belong to the Harry Potter religion. Uh, we, we read all those stories to our kids. My 16-year-old has read all seven Harry Potter books you know, eight times. We've seen all the films. Um, so de definitely a case of, of a new religious movement happening in, in our house. Um, yeah, and, the, and these uh, new immersive media worlds, if they get reinforced in different places, they do seem to be more effective and more powerful. I have cultivation he uh, theory here at the end of the slide, which I think of as a type of theory of immersion or absorption. Cultivation theory is an older theory that talks about the ways that uh, people who watch a lot of TV are more likely to believe that the real world is similar to the world on TV. 
Some of these theories are used to make sense of uh, Harry Potter, actually, as I already mentioned, or Star Wars, or the Avatar effect. Here I have a, a slide um, on the Avatar effect, and I have a quote I want to read, too. Oh, yeah, a headline from the UK's Guardian. Moviegoers feel depressed and even suicidal at not being able to visit the utopian alien planet. I don't know, maybe some of you haven't seen this film, but... Um, fans flooded the internet with their confused feelings. On the site Avatar Forums, the topic ways to cope with the depression of the dream of Pandora being intangible has more than 1,000 posts. In a similar forum, one user wrote, When I woke up this morning after watching Avatar for the first time yesterday, the world seemed gray. It just seemed so meaningless. I don't really see any reason to keep doing things at all. I live in a dying world. I even contemplate suicide, thinking that if I do it, I will be reborn in a world similar to Pandora. There's actually scholars in comparative literature who study sci-fi and fantasy literature um, who've talked about this as alternate world syndrome or alternate world disorder. So it's not just people in media studies, it's people in religious studies. A number of people are interested actually in you know, the ways that some of these media franchises can do what religious worlds did for people, right? In some ways, religion is um, an imagined world that people live in, populated by spirits, right, and ghosts and ancestors and gods. Is there a way in which these new media franchises are taking over some of those functions for people? Okay, then we zip over to part two. Hope I'm doing okay on time. <laughs> um, to think, uh, in a, think in a few minutes about, um, to think, uh, about the American spiritual landscape and maybe ways in which these media effects theories can help us think about, think in new ways about how things are changing um, in the American religious landscape. Now when Joanna got here, go out, got up here with her sort of new, her new data, I was worried. I was like, oh no, she's gonna contradict everything I'm gonna say about religion in America. Fortunately, she didn't. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I was getting, getting concerned, but uh, I actually think uh, our talks fit really well together and I'm excited to, to hear how the whole panel went and how the whole day goes. I think there's gonna be a lot of uh, good connections there. Okay, so um, some of you may be familiar with the Pew Forum. They do a lot of uh, surveys of religious America. This is kind of a snapshot view of religious America. When I show this to my students, they notice how many Christians there are. <laughs> they didn't think there were that many Christians. Uh, you know, Roughly 70% of America self-identifies as Christian. Of course, as we all know here, that big Christian group encompasses a real range, right, of levels of devotion and practice and, and belief, right? There's a real range there in Christianity as there, as there is in any, any religion. My students are also surprised at how small the other groups are, <laughs> you know, how, how, how small uh, American Judaism is, how small uh, American Islam is, and especially American Buddhism. One other surprise, I think, on this slide is the number of unaffiliated, which is in the lower right, you can see there, or the number of religious nuns. These are people who say, I have no religion. That's a pretty big number, 23%. Um, I say it's surprising because in the last 25 or 30 years, it really has changed over time. This number and a couple of other numbers I'm going to talk about in a second have really been surprising all right, in the history of American polling. So for instance, if you go back 10 years, what is this number here? It's 23%. Uh, if you go back 10 years, that number is 15%. If you go back 20 years, it's 7%. If you go back 30 years, it's 6 or 7%. 40 years, it's 6 or 7%. So something is happening since the 1990s in American culture. Something is changing that seems to be changing around the same time that Americans start to buy and use personal computers. Uh, it remains to be seen what the, what the relationship is between the rise of uh, personal electronic technologies and the, and the rise of the religiously unaffiliated, but maybe a few other slides. Something else that's happening and that is quite dramatic in the, la in the last 30 years uh, since the 1990s is the rise of Americans who call themselves spiritual, right, or spiritual but not religious. I know we all have friends and I'm sure people in the room who call themselves spiritual but not religious or spiritual. So, this is also a, a really surprising number. The number here is 27%. The number here is 27% of Americans. I've seen other surveys that have that number. Uh, depending on how the survey works and how it's worded, that number is like 33, 35% of America 
So that's one in three Americans saying I'm spiritual but not religious. It's really quite surprising, and you don't see those kind of numbers 30 years ago. So that's another thing that's changing. Uh, you see a corresponding decline in the number of people who say they're participating in traditional religious groups. All right, you see a corresponding decline in the number of Americans who say they are affiliated with a traditional religious group. The sociologist of religion, Tobin Grant, maybe some of you know him, has called this the great decline in American religion over the last 30 years. So it's not just me. <laughs> you know, uh, this, is, this is not my new information. I don't have new information. Um, this is information that a lot of people are talking about and actually trying to figure out you know, what are the source of some of these dramatic changes, a kind of a decline in traditional religion and a rise uh, in spiritual and unaffiliated. So uh, a few last slides on the ways that electronic media might play a role in moving the shift along. There are a bunch of studies that suggest a role. Studies have shown that since the 60s, television programming has often been critical of traditional religion and stereotyped traditional religion in certain ways, and we can talk about some of those details if you want. That uh, certainly most people today get their information about religion from the internet and not, not from traditional sources. Many sociologists of religion have studied this. Um, others have looked at the ways that participatory media culture, and this is especially the media culture that we're in now, which is that we spend so much time every day um, on a laptop, on our cell phone, right, using apps and so on. This is really a participatory media culture, right, where we're all senders and receivers of media content, right? And there's, there's an effect there that this kind of particip participatory culture relocates authority in the self rather than traditional religious um, authorities and institutions. And we're seeing that even among religious groups that use platforms, as they all do, right, like Facebook and Twitter, are witnessing these kinds of changing perceptions of religious authority. And then I have there on the slide the problem of the Pope's tweets. The Pope does tweet. I don't know, I don't know if you know that, but the Pope does tweet. Seems like a great way to, to get your message out. You know, you have millions of followers, millions of people see your messages. On the other hand, it does do something to, to the ways that people think about authority, right? Um, it removes a sort of authoritative pronouncement, uh, the singular pronouncement, the sacred pronouncements of the Pope from a sort of set apart sacred space and puts them in the sort of rough and tumble frontier of the Twitterverse, right? Where things can get critiqued and torn apart um, and, or retweeted um, and so on. So there is a more high, there's a more there's a leveling of religious authority in some of these uh, social media platforms. Okay, and then digital culture and fluid identity is another thing that scholars talk quite a bit about. That digital culture, the app, um, the app, um, the app store or the internet, pr seems to promote spiritual exp exploration, or what one scholar calls tinkering, boundary crossing, and religious fluidity that the logic of the internet and app use cuts against religious efforts to control or determine religious identity, all right, and that this new kind of digital environment is a new sort of symbolic toolkit, sort of like I said earlier when I was talking about symbolic interactionism, right, that the media environment provides a sort of new set of discourses, ideas, and symbols that people use to produce new ways of thinking about what faith is and what belief is and what belonging, what belonging is to a, to a religious or spiritual group. Uh, this is something that Joanna talked about as well, that digital culture means more exposure to different religions and perhaps increasing religious pluralism. By pluralism, I mean an increasing interest among people in embracing religious diversity. And you see this, uh, in, you see this developing religious pluralism across groups in America today, even among um, the most conservative religious groups. Uh, you see this kind of uh, emergent pluralism. Then my last slide. You know, is it also possible that there's a way in which um, electronic media themselves represent a kind of mysticism um, or that bring a kind of mysticism or spirituality to people, a new kind of spiritual sensibility? I mentioned earlier, you know, is it possible that entertainment media is a kind of a new imaginative world that people live in that's akin to kind of, uh, akin to kind of the religious imagined worlds that people lived in before? Is our immersion in these worlds, is our immersion in video games, in films, or other forms of entertain, entertainment media, is it replacing um, imaginative religious worlds? Uh, a number of people are thinking about this today. Um, it's also true that religious and spiritual people think about electronic media itself 
are themselves as conduits for spiritual power. I have an image there of Oral Roberts, who is one of the first televangelists to think about this, and he actually put his, his right hand up on a plate of glass in front of the camera, and he told his television viewers to also go up to the television and put their hands on his, on their TV, that the, that the media itself doesn't just communicate words, but it communicates the Holy Spirit. Um, and televangelists around the world still, still think like this, and it's not just Christians, right? There are many others. There are many people who call themselves spiritual who think like this. Uh, Neo-pagans. Maybe some of you have heard of iPhone scrying. If you haven't heard of that, you might want to Google it. iPhone scrying. This is, scrying is like meditating on a reflective surface. It could be your iPhone or it could be your computer screen in order to catch glimpses of departed spirits or see into another dimension or another spiritual world. Maybe we could Google that during the break. Okay, so, um, so there's a number of ways that... Um, Religious people are treating uh, media as spiritual or myst mystical. And then, of course, uh, media narratives provide new sacred narratives, as I said earlier, new ways of maintaining an ordered life and organizing your life. I know I organize my life with my iPhone, right? And also films and shows and social media that can even provide experiences of awe and wonder. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Thank you. The list of things that I, am, <laughs> I have been assigned to explain is even more voluminous than, than your list, which also happens to be, include things like, you know, uh, could you extend your work on uh, health literacy into religious literacy, <laughs> and what about extending it into the new media environment, and, uh, and, and at least five other things. So I've been given three extra minutes. <laughs> That's my <laughs> I pledge. All right, so um, I do a lot of work on health literacy. Um, and uh, if you don't know, uh, health literacy in the United States is abysmal. Uh, for example, nine out of 10 American adults have difficulty using everyday what we call uh, health information, such as calculating how much medicine to give a sick child based on their weight. Uh, they, can't, they don't really understand how vaccines work. They don't understand why it's important to know your family's uh, history with cancer. So as a result of truly abysmal uh, health literacy in the United States, in 2010, the US Department of Health and Human Services decided to come up with a, uh, a national action plan to improve uh, health literacy. And to get to the bottom line, they concluded that at least part of the problem was due to two things. One was an over-reliance on written materials. Uh, and even those written materials were often almost exclusively crafted without any input from the target audience. And one of the first lessons I want to transmit to you is that you are not your target audience 90% of the time. You need to remember that. You're not creating for yourself or your friends. Um, there, there typically is no uh, you know, target audience of overeducated intellectuals. I would be in that target audience, but we're, uh, that's not who has the problem, particularly in health literacy. And so. Um, for example, uh, what you end up, if you leave it to government agencies, this is from National Cancer Institute. This is their brochure. You may have, some of the women in the room may see this uh, image as, as very eerily familiar. You probably had it in, you know, fifth grade, third grade health class. Uh, I think they've been using the same image. Uh, you know, it's just horrible. I mean, uh, the cervix is a passageway. You know, uh, the cervix makes mucus. Oh, tell me more. Um, <laughs> show got off. This is page one. Who would go on? You know, I mean, I just want to kill, poke my eyes out. So, um, what? So I got into this argument with the head of the National Institute of Health, Francis Collins. I said, please, God, you know, why are you spending millions of dollars reproducing such things every year? and why aren't you using narratives or stories? And he says, well, we can't use narratives and stories because no one has ever done a, a randomly controlled clinical trial using the same information in a narrative and a non-narrative format. And I said, I will do that. And I, I did, and I'm not gonna present all of it today, but what I am gonna present is part of the narrative 
that perhaps you could use to replace something like this, but again, it should be informed by your target audience. And in this example, I'm gonna show you part of Tamale lesson, which is uh, targeted towards a Latina audience uh, who live in East LA. This is not my language, this is their language. We worked extensively with focus groups to make sure that this is how they conversed about things. When you hear them refer to down there, that's because that, that's what they're referring to it as. We had a script writer, Josefina Lopez, who uh, did Real Women Have Curves, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, so she's also uh, responsible for making it culturally sensitive. I'm just gonna show you a brief clip. Oh, go back. I think I'm showing you a brief clip, let me see. <laughs> Yeah, I've been trying to reach you. What? No, I'm not making this up. You gave me this disease. Uh, you know what? Yeah, don't bother calling me again. We're through. ¿Qué pasa? What's up? Nothing. Your boyfriend? Oh, just too much salt. Huh? We know what we're doing. Do you? Do you? What? Know what you're doing? You and your boyfriend? You would understand. Why not? Because you're a prude. You always think you're so perfect and so good and you will probably judge me. Hi. Here it is. Oh. I can't believe you got the skinty and yet a dress for a hundred dollars. The girl who was supposed to wear it got pregnant and can't fit into it. Rosita is gonna look beautiful in it. Ay, one mother's tragedy. Is now another mother's boutique special. These girls nowadays don't respect themselves and open up their legs for anyone. Not like in our day when a man had to marry you to even look down there. Mm. He's a jerk. What did he do? You're gonna tell Ma? No, I'm not. He gave me a disease, the HP virus. That's terrible. What is that? You're that innocent? No, I know stuff. Okay, what's HP? Hmm? Huntington Park. No, is the human papilloma virus. I have it in my crotch. Hey, yuck. How did you get that? How do you think, stupid? From sex, it can cause cervical cancer. You have cancer? No, no. I have a virus that can cause cervical cancer. How did you find out? Mm, through a pop test. Well, lucky I found out now than later, right? Well, what are you going to do about it? I'm gonna get a pap test every year to make sure I don't develop any abnormal cells. That sucks. Have you ever had a pap test? No, I told you I'm a virgin. Okay, it's true. You mainly get HPV from sex. But so what? You're 21 and you should get yourself checked out anyway. Checked out for what? A pap test. What's a pap test? No, nothing. nothing. Hey. I got on things too. I'm about to be a woman. You're about to be 15. Not quite a woman. Petra got married when she was 15. And I was too young. I mean, why don't you go try on your dress? Why are you going to have a pap test? Pap test? That's what they're talking about while they're making tamales. Can you believe this? Well, every woman should know about pap tests. Why are you perverting your sister? She doesn't need to know about those things. Yes, she does. Do you want her to get cancer? Who's talking about cancer? You can get cancer down there. Yes, but Connie's not like you. She's a virgin. Uh, pap tests are not just for women who have sex. 
I do you know women from 21 to 60 they should get checked at least every two years and if you're sexually active you should get checked more often I heard 50% of the women have this virus that many yes and if you don't get checked you can get cervical cancer and can spread all over your body and you could die you should get yourself checked Petra my husband is dead why would I need a pap test who has the time or the money it's not that expensive. It's an easy checkup. Plus, I hear women your age. I ain't that old. Well, I'm just saying, you're on the higher risk. Plus, it's very easy. You don't even have to go to a hospital. You can go to the clinic on Central, and it's free. Does it hurt? Um, no, not really. Just like a mosquito bite like this. Ow. <laughs> it's Ow. embarrassing. And it's probably uncomfortable. No, it's more like this. Okay, when you go to the doctor, you sit on the table and they spread your legs like this. I stop. And what exactly does the doctor do? Okay, so let's pretend this is your vagina. It's not that color. Petra, just pretend. Okay, I'm a tamal. So the doctor has like this device, this metal device. They just spread the walls of your vagina. I don't say words like that. Petra, you've never had this test done before? It's not as bad as it looks. Yeah. They take this mascara type wand and then they just wipe you on the inside. Like, oh. Yeah, they take a little sample of yourselves. So that's. Yes, the chicken was my idea, I have to say. <laughs> I was going to use a turkey, but they thought that was, that was too crude, uh, apparently. So anyway, but again, how do you explain to women in a non-threatening way what happens during a pap test, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that was Tamale Lesson. Let me continue on. We actually did, a, did do a randomized control trial of 900 women. and. Uh, with both the narrative and non-narrative. I'm not going to talk about the, the non-narrative today, but I want you to pay attention particularly to the fact that the narrative, the story worked across the board, mm -hmm. okay? So it wasn't that the story didn't work for our European-American and our African-American groups, but what I do want you to notice is that it really worked best for the Mexican-American group who were the target audience. Um, it, they went from having the lowest rate of cancers, uh, cervical cancer screening, 32% at pretest, uh, to having the highest rate, 83%, mm -hmm. at six months out. Um, because it was, in fact, tailored towards that audience, but it, it nevertheless worked for other people. Okay, so why? Why did it work best for the Latinas? Uh, well, it worked best because they identified with the key characters. Um, which identification with the key characters allows you to, to audience members to sort of walk in someone else's shoes um, and to try to acknowledge that life is complex and suspend moral judgment. Um, so it's not who we identify with as a character is not random. We tend to identify with one of two types of people. One is characters we like. We tend to identify with characters we really like but we also tend to be very selective and identify with people who have some sort of similarity to us, whether that's age, race, gender, um, and any sort of readily available physical cues in particular. So one of the things that we found is that it was the girls who identified, the younger girls who identified with Lupita across all three ethnic groups who ended up getting the majority of the PAP tests not the older women who tended to identify with Petra, who was the more traditional character. Um, the second ingredient that you need for narrative engagement to occur, or excuse me, narrative persuasion to occur, is narrative engagement, which is, uh, I think you just mentioned recently, it's this idea that you have to be engrossed, or what we call engaged, or what we call transported into the story. There's something about being absorbed or transported into a narrative that allows you to suspend disbelief uh, and it let, makes you much less defensive. In fact, there's a, uh, a study by Moore Bousset who says it, it sort of decreases 
Neurotis may be particularly well suited to decrease reactance and counter arguing and selective avoidance of arguments. And it tends to increase your perceived vulnerability uh, and self efficacy. And importantly, it, it increases the uptake of modeled behavior. Actually, seeing a behavior being performed is much more effective than just hearing about characters talk about it mm -hmm. on screen. Um, and also, having people actually engage in a behavior has a secondary benefit, which is that other people see them engaging in that behavior, and it has a snowball effect, <coughs> right? Because that is changing the, the cultural norms. So for example, we had a, um, we had a outreach from Hollywood Health and Society, who I do work with at the Annenberg School, and we worked with Hollywood writers. We had them uh, work with them to try to essentially embed uh, organ donation storylines on 26 different shows. And uh, we actually ended up getting a, an uptick in national organ donation. And it wasn't just the original viewers who were responsible for that uptick, it was also their family and friends, right? We never saw the show because we tend to follow what other people are doing. Okay, so uh, I think the most kind of clear example of religion is not mine, <laughs> unfortunately. So I called uh, uh, Sohad Marir, whose data this is, and I asked if it would be okay to present it, and she said yes. Uh, so let me just say, I thought this was a very clever study. Um, she's a young Muslim scholar. Uh, she actually randomly assigned 196 white participants to either view six episodes of a program uh, from the uh, Canadian broadcasting company called Little Mosque on the Prairie, or six episodes of Friends, uh, which is an all-white cast. And basically, what she did is she interviewed them at three time points. Before they saw their six episodes of one or the other show, immediately after viewing, and six weeks after viewing. And what you see here is the, her results from how warm they rated uh, Arabs on a scale from zero being zero degrees being very cold to 100 degrees being very warm. Um, and what you can see is at, at baseline here, there's no difference between the two groups who saw Little Mosque or Friends. But if you look at immediately after viewing, you see that people who saw Little Mosque <coughs> actually have uptick of between 8 to 10 degrees warmer uh, than the people who saw friends who didn't move at all, basically. And what's very interesting, I find, is that even four to six weeks out, you still had an uptick, a marginally significant uptick in warmth towards Arabs uh, among the group who saw Little Mosque. So she also found that there's, there's measures of whether you preferred different groups, and if the people who uh, saw Little Mosque didn't differ at baseline, but they did. Uh, actually immediately after viewing, and again, four to six weeks after viewing, uh, what you see is the blue bar is, this is the difference between preferring whites versus Arabs, and so you see that that really went down if you saw a little mosque as opposed to friends. Okay, and this is uh, an implicit bias towards Arab Americans, it gets around social desirability because it works on response times. And so still here what you see is that uh, bias went towards Arab Muslims went down significantly uh, immediately after viewing and remained lower, uh, significantly lower, uh, up to four to six weeks after viewing. So she concludes that all three of these measures, <coughs> warmth, preference, and implicit bias, actually were, uh, the underlying mechanism was identifying with the character, with the characters on the show. So I have that reference if you're interested. Uh, so the conclusions as far are engaging narratives appear to be a promising way to reduce bias against religious minorities and identification with the religious outgroup appear to be an important underlying mechanism. Uh, what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to show you some work that I did with some of my students, one of my students, Tracy Gilly, and 
my colleagues at Hollywood Health and Society to look at whether attitudes could sway not just whether persuasive narratives could persuade not just attitudes, but policy as well, and whether different narratives featuring the same outgroup could uh, have a cumulative effect. And so here is a storyline we worked with the writers on. It's called Royal Pains. It dealt with Anna, the uh, character right there. Uh, she is. Uh, well, I'll let you see the storyline. The purpose of breath could be a sign that pots have broken off and scattered to your lungs. And I have to ask, how long have you been a girl? Do your parents know that you're taking estrogen? My mom tries to be supportive, but she insisted I see a therapist. Mm -hmm. And made me promise not to start hormones until I turned 17 and not push for surgery. But a few months ago, I started taking estrogen on your back. self administered It's just a pill. No, sometimes it's not that simple. We should. OK, so obviously, uh, this is a transgender storyline. And what we did is immediately after the, trans, the Anna storyline, that particular episode aired, we um, put a link on Royal Pains website. We got 488 regular viewers of Royal Pains. Some of them had seen the episode, some of them had not. So these are all regular viewers of that particular show um, and just whether they happened to see that particular uh, episode. And as you can see here, um, attitudes towards transgender people on a scale from one to 10 uh, was more sympathetic if you had seen the Anna episode than if you had not. Uh, and interestingly, support for transgender policies also moved uh, such that it was more sympathetic for policies such as uh, allowing transgender individuals to use the, the bathroom associated with their gender identity. And finally, and I think this is very important, that uh, the effect was cumulative. So multiple exposures to different storylines that all of which were sympathetic had an additive effect. So here what you see is people who saw no narratives um, people, you can see that it's going up. People who saw one narrative, uh, this is transgender people, transgender policies, it's the blue. And then finally, if you saw two or more narratives, you had higher, more sympathetic positions on both uh, transgender individuals and transgender policies. Okay. And then finally, my final assignment for today was to <laughs> talk about the new media environment and how this might impact narrative persuasion. Um, here, I want to talk about some work we did with East Los High, which is a popular uh, Hulu show um, uh, aimed largely at Latina teens, but not entirely. We um, engaged them at season four. They came to us and said, uh, we have upcoming season four. There's going to be an alcohol abuse storyline and a contraception storyline. Uh, would you like to do a pre-test, post-test mm -hmm. analysis? And we said, absolutely. Um, but we were interested in not just looking at, again, did the storylines have story consistent impact? We know that should happen. But the interesting thing about this occasion is that Hulu releases all 12 episodes of the season in one day, mm -hmm. which is now pretty standard. So this allowed us to look at things like <laughs> the effect of, you know, things of co-viewing. Did they watch it with someone? Face-to-face -face discussion, online discussion, <clears throat> what's called second screen. That means the primary screen is the television, and you're doing something with a secondary screen. And finally, binge viewing. Did they binge and watch all of them in a relatively short time? And how did that impact on narrative persuasion? All right. So. Not surprisingly, you see story consistent movement. You again see the impact of identification. The more you identi identified with Jacob, the more likely you were to show a change in attitude towards binge drinking. Similarly, the more you identified with Camilla, the more likely you were to change your attitudes towards contraception. But what we were particularly interested in is what about the viewing experience in the new media environment? And what you can see clearly is that co-viewing, second screening, face-to-face -face discussion, and binge viewing all kind of increased 
uh, the impact of the storyline, but what decreased it is binge watching. So binge watching decreases your impact. You see the same exact thing here, even more dramatically, with the, uh, this is the contraception storyline. So uh, to finish off then, at least in this study, we saw that binge watching dramatically impacts your impact, uh, dramatically decreases your impact. Uh, Co-viewing, face-to-face discussion, and here, second screening increased your impact. Now this may be an anomaly. I was surprised by this result. But then when we looked at more carefully, what were they second screening? It turns out that, <laughs> that East Los High has what they call, um, not second, sort of secondary, what is their term? Uh, additional material, online material. So they have things about the character, backstory about the character, mm. chat lines, they have links to the topics being discussed. And so that's what they were second screening. So that's why you got the increase. I actually think that if it hadn't, had been more what we consider to be second screening, in other words, you're checking your emails, that's gonna pop you out of being transported into the narrative. That's gonna reduce your identification, okay? So I think that the second screening here is a bit of an anomaly. I didn't present some results that I've done with my students also that shows that if you can make a choice in an interactive uh, context, a narrative, in an interactive narrative, even if you make <coughs> simple choices for the person, like what they should have for lunch, what they should wear that day, it actually makes them take on ownership of that person more mm -hmm. and ups their identification, which ups their mm -hmm. impact. So just finishing up then, future directions and narrative persuasion really needs to recognize the rapidly changing context. Your favorite TV program is no longer available, you know, had a prescribed time once a week. Uh, and also the increasing prevalence of transmedia storytelling, this idea that uh, shows are realizing that particularly with in the new media environment with younger audiences they have to have these sort of supplemental materials uh, on various characters etc um, chat lines things like that and you really have to take that into account thank you Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mick Moore, and uh, really excited to be here. Um, so Sarah, I uh, appreciated the introduction. I'm going to do a little bit more to explain um, the work that I do, and then I'm going to run through a few projects that uh, my agency has done over the last decade or so um, that speak specifically to um, humor, social impact, and religion. Um, so. The, so the, the proposition I wanted to start with is that if we want to influence the way that people think about a particular religion or religious community or religion in general, that comedy can help. Um, and we saw a little bit in the, the clip on, um, uh, on the hot tamale clip, right, that used some humor, right, mixed in with some more serious conversation. Right, that this is uh, not uncommon, right, for those of us who do persuasive work, but um, most of my work, almost exclusively my work, has been in the comedy space. Um, one of the challenges, though, if you work in comedy and are trying to have a social impact, is that the people that you work with who work on these issues that are very serious don't always think that their issues are funny. Um, and so often I'll talk to a potential client who works on some very serious issue and they'll say, well, I love comedy and I think comedy is great, but it's really not great for my issue. Um, so I spend a lot of my time trying to sort of explain to people how comedy might in fact be effective on their issue. Um, say that again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, try, I try to explain it in a funny way. Um, so, uh, so the second question I want to ask is sort of why, uh, why do we want to influence people around religion? Like to what end? And for me, typically, it's sort of one of three, uh, three things. The first is uh, to challenge negative stereotypes, um, and that's a pretty common one. Right? Um, we saw, I think, from the data at the beginning, right, that people have certain perceptions of different religious groups, and those perceptions are based on what they see in media. Right? And for some groups, right, those either um, help them develop or at least reinforce negative stereotypes. 
um, Islam being um, probably the prime example, but they're, they're not alone. Um, so that's one. The second is to challenge misconceptions, right? So there's a huge amount of ignorance um, about religion, um, uh, especially religions that are not one's own. And so uh, misconceptions can get compounded by the media. So what are some ways that humor can help challenge those misconceptions? Um, and the third is around shifting ideas or behavior uh, within a religious community itself. Um, and this gets into questions of audience that have already been um, uh, addressed a little bit. Um, but with every project, there's always a the question of, is, is our goal to um, speak to the religious community uh, the content is about, or is our goal to reach communities outside of that community so they better understand? And occasionally, we try to do both. Um, all right, so how does comedy work in this space? Uh, so uh, there's four things I like to talk about um, in terms of how comedy can be effective. Uh, the first is comedy can help stigmatize um, bad behavior or beliefs, right? Essentially, if you're um, being made fun of or a particular belief is being made fun of, um, it can create a stigma against that. Um, or if the, the, uh, uh, the object of the humor, the, the, the folks who the, the humor is targeting, um, that can help reinforce um, uh, a stigma against that kind of behavior. So that's the first. Um, the second is that humor, uh, even biting humor, can be a door opener, a uh, conversation starter. Um, and uh, part of the goal, right, when uh, with those of us who do this kind of work, is you want to get people talking, especially about subjects that are hard to talk about or that society has told us that you're not supposed to talk about. Um, the third is that um, for the organizations and, and individuals who work around social change issues, so around issues of, of racism or uh, you know, climate or immigration or whatever, pick an issue, um, it uh, can be really um, exhausting to engage in this work over time. And one of the things that humor can do is um, to help, uh, help people stick around for longer. Um, uh, it allows your engagement, it allows people to sustain their engagement because um, uh, it takes some of the weight off of it, uh, at least temporarily. Um, and the third, um, and this is something we haven't really talked about too much, but the, you know, we've been talking about entertainment, which is you know, Hollywood and TV, et cetera. Um, but for, uh, for my agency in particular, we're really interested in how um, the uh, content that we create interacts with media, meaning uh, news media and, uh, and other forms of media, right? So there was a little bit uh, earlier about the amplification effect. That's a really huge part of the work that, that we do is to create something that will actually attract media attention. Uh, doing something that's funny uh, is more likely to get media attention than something that is not funny. Um, because news programs are not funny. So they really like things that are funny. Um, great, all right, so now I'm gonna give you uh, four examples of projects that I worked on. Each uh, was intended to target or at least focus on a different religious constituency. Uh, three of them are videos and I'll show clips and one of them is not. All right, so the first project um, was mentioned in my introduction um, 10 years ago this week, actually. Um, I did my first ever web video, um, and it was with a comedian named Sarah Silverman, uh, and the video was called The Great Schlepp. And the purpose of the video was um, to convince uh, young Jews, primarily, um, to go to Florida and to talk to their grandparents about why they should vote for Barack Obama. And the reason why we thought we needed the video was because at the time, right, the Jews, uh, uh, Jews in Florida, who tend to be older, were sort of uncomfortable. They didn't know Obama, and there had been an aggressive campaign to convince people that he was not good for the Jewish community, um, and this had taken hold in Florida. And so we had reached out to Sarah Silverman, and we did this video. We did a whole campaign. So I'll show a brief clip from the video um, just to give you a sense of the humor and the message. If you knew that visiting your grandparents could change the world, would you do it? Of course you would. You'd have to be a douche nozzle not to. 
Hey, it's Sarah. Silverman. If Barack Obama doesn't become the next president of the United States, I'm going to blame the Jews. I am. And I know you're saying like, oh my God, Sarah, I can't believe you're saying this. Jews are the most liberal, scrappy, civil rights-y people there are. Yes, that's true. But you're forgetting a whole large group of Jews that are not that way. And they go by several aliases. Nana, Papa, uh, Zadie, Bubby. Plain old grandma and grandpa, these are the people who vote in Florida. And the Florida vote can make or break an election. If you don't think that's true, why don't you think back to two elections ago when a little man named Al Gore got fucked by Florida. I'm making this video to urge you, all of you, to schlep over to Florida and convince your grandparents to vote Obama. It can make the difference. Explain to them that we're all the same inside. You know, you could compare an elderly Jewish woman like Nana to a young black man. They may seem totally different, but on paper, they're the same. I mean, think about it, track suits. Let's start there, they both love track suits. They can't get enough of them. Uh, what else, car of choice? The Cadillac. They're both crazy about their grandkids. What else? They, they like things and bling and money and jewelry and stuff. Uh, they, they both say yo all the time, or Jews go right to left, oi. Uh, what else? They, um, all their friends are dying? No. No. That is true in general. You know why your grandparents don't like Barack Obama? Because his name sounds scary, it sounds Muslim, which he's obviously not. Yes, Barack Hussein Obama, it's a super fucking shitty name. But you'd think that somebody named Manischewitz Guberman might understand that. The name Barack is a Hebrew word, it means lightning. And I would much rather have a president whose name means lightning than a president named John whose name means toilet, or a guy who fucks hookers. Here are some fun facts. Barack Obama's foreign policy is much more stabilizing than John McCain's and much better for Israel. He, he wants to protect social security. His brisket is beyond. It's beyond. He, he's, he's, circum, he's, circum, he's circumsupersized. You don't have to use facts, use threats. There's nobody more important or influential over your grandparents than their grandkids, you. If they vote for Barack Obama, they're gonna get another visit this year. If not, let's just hope they stay healthy until next year. Barack Obama is the goodest person we've ever had as a presidential choice. He's honest and he's kind, and quite frankly, he's probably our last hope of ending this country's reputation as the assholes of the universe. So please go to this website and get your fat Jewish asses on a plane to Florida. Love, Nana. Let's see, vote for Obama. Gonna visit grandmama. Vote for McCain. To me, you're a shit stain. I just made that up on top of my head. Um, yeah, I'm proud of myself. That's Sarah Silverman. Um, so the the purpose of the video was, I think I said at the beginning, like there's you know um, there's subjects that you're not supposed to talk about, right? That are taboo, right? The three that come up over and over again that are supposedly taboo are um, are religion. Uh, race and politics, and so we decided to do a video about all three of them um, as, as my first ever video. And, uh, and what was really challenging, right, is that the truth was it, that race was at the core of, um, uh, of, the, of the problem, right? And so we couldn't uh, break through unless we were willing to talk about race, and we had to convince young people to talk to their grandparents about race, right? Which is like in the family, and like you know your grandparents are kind of racist, but no one says anything because you're all being polite. 
right? That's pretty common. So how do we break through? How do we like get past that barrier that exists? And so having someone who is extremely blunt and direct and funny like Sarah can help to do that by just stating out in the open like what's happening and what we need to do. So I'm not gonna play the rest of the video because it's four minutes long, um, but if you've never seen it before, I recommend it. It's still funny after 10 years, in my opinion. Um, so uh, I could talk forever about that campaign. Um, ultimately, we ended up getting thousands and thousands of Jews to go down to Florida to have these conversations. Uh, the video was viewed millions and millions of times. We ended up with about 300 million media impressions for the project, um, which is to say, Basically, everybody wanted to cover this, um, and that was all intentional because what, you know, what media outlet doesn't want to have a conversation between a grand, grandkid and a grandparent talking about politics and race, and it was adorable. So every network wanted to cover this story, and that was all part of our goal, right? Because even if you didn't see the video, you probably saw something on the nightly news or on CNN or on late night talk shows or wherever it was, and each of these sort of reinforced um, a, a couple of different things that were important to us. One, that young people really supported, young Jews in particular, but young people supported Barack Obama, right? And that this issue, right, needed to be talked about in the open, right? The issue of the role of race in impacting people's opinion about Barack Obama. So um, uh, uh, there, this is not, this targeted obviously the Jewish community, um, I'll talk about another project that speaks more to the religious dimensions within the Jewish community. This one um, didn't, but, um, uh, but it's an interesting example of targeting a particular community to have a conversation. Um, that's a difficult conversation. So, let me escape from there. All right, so the second campaign I'm gonna talk about um, is, uh, uh, back right after I finished this project, so this was 2008, so 2009, um, I was working in an organization that did a lot of work in the sort of progressive faith uh, community. Um, and uh, everybody knows who Glenn Beck is? Great, okay. So Glenn Beck back then was behind Oprah Winfrey, the second most popular um, uh, uh, talk show host um, in the country. He had a television show, he had a radio show, he had, you know. Um, and one of the favorite targets of Glenn Beck were uh, progressive faith uh, leaders and institutions. Um, and so one day in, I don't remember what month it was, in early 2009, uh, Glenn Beck made a statement about uh, uh, churches that say social justice or, or people or clergy in, in churches that talk about social justice. And he said something like, you know, you should leave your church um, if you see the word social justice. Um, so I was working in an organization doing communications work and the response from the uh, sort of progressive faith communities was, as you might expect, like outrage, a lot of finger wagging and some angry press releases. Uh, the sum total of which was nothing, it had no effect whatsoever because who cares about a bunch of press releases that get, you know, everybody knows that Glenn Beck says this kind of stuff, right? So I had just done this project with Sarah Silverman and so I convinced my boss, I was like, why don't we do something different? Why don't we use comedy somehow to get people engaged um, and to get religious communities specifically engaged around this issue? So what we did was, we did this. We did a campaign called um, Hike You Glenn Beck. Um, well, that's how you pronounce it, it's Haiku Glenn Beck. But we invited people to write haiku responses to what Glenn Beck had said, and they could submit them on Twitter, and then we, they had a website and you could rank them, and, and we invited celebrities to write their own haiku. And this was still like early-ish Twitter, and so it was sort of experimental. So these are some of the ones that people, these all people came up with on their own. And Jesus said to all his hungry disciples, hands off my fish, chumps. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. Anyway, there, there's some great ones. Um, so we got thousands of people to write these haiku because everyone loves writing haiku, right? Um, and everyone learned how to write haiku in school. And, uh, and they could submit them really easily because all you had to do was put a hashtag on it on Twitter, Beku uh, was the hashtag we created. And it would automatically get submitted into a system and it would come onto our website. So we did this, and then after a few weeks, we, um, we publicized 
uh, uh, an action where for 24 hours we would tweet one haiku every minute at Glenn Beck from this campaign. Um, and needless to say, the media really liked the campaign, right? So not only did we have thousands of people participate, but we got coverage in all kinds of press, um, which amplified our message, right, about what religious communities of all stripes thought of Glenn Beck's statement, right? And of course, Glenn Beck being a narcissist, he had to talk about it on his show, right? So <laughs> Glenn Beck, I like, someone calls me, so you have to turn on the show. And he's reading off the haiku on his show, which is amazing. Um, you can always rely on someone's narcissism um, to be, be helpful. Um, so anyway, I won't get into sort of the long, uh, sort of year-long part of this campaign, but for us it was an interesting way um, to both experiment with media and technology, to sort of leverage creating an audience, um, and to use humor um, to support a religious community pushing back against um, uh, this statement from Glenn Beck. All right. So the third project I'm going to talk about was mentioned earlier, um, and we've had a number of um, examples of, of Islam in media. Um, so I was approached by um, the actor-comedian Asif Mandvi um, back in, I think, 2013, but all the years get blurry. I think it was 2013. And he had been, he'd been on The Daily Show uh, as a correspondent for about seven years. And what was interesting in his experience on The Daily Show is that he um, had covered a lot of stories uh, around the Muslim community and, and sort of bigotry in particular, um, uh, mosques that were not allowed to be built or that were you know, people who were attacked, et cetera. Um, and he had uh, uh, become a fairly high profile figure within the Muslim community. There aren't that many um, sort of big TV stars um, who are Muslim. And uh, through this experience, he both learned a lot about some of the challenges facing the community in the United States and wanted to use his, uh, his talent as an actor and a comedian to do something about it. And so we met with him and worked for a while over the course of about a year and a half and developed a web series um, called Halal and the Family. Um, and the idea behind the web series, it was, it was for two things. One, we were, it was a parody of like, the Cosby Show, All in the Family, sort of old style 70s and 80s sitcoms, family sitcoms, right? Um, and it was also uh, satirizing American attitudes towards Muslims. Um, and to do it, we created at the sort of head of this family this very over the top character that he plays, who you'll see from the clip, but who like, who is Muslim, but has adopted a lot of Americans sort of typical attitudes about Muslims, which is to say not great attitudes about Muslims. Um, uh, and uh, so I'll play a clip from the episode and we can talk about it. Uh. We're just an ordinary family living in your town. But don't worry, we like monster trucks and football, even though we're brown. We hate courage. So welcome to our clan. There's no plan to change the way you live or how you pray. Cause we're just here to obey. Your various laws and local ordinances. No, what are you doing? Okay, we're not that kind of Muslim. Hold it right there, young lady. What's going on? Nothing. It doesn't sound like nothing. It's just... Some girl was making fun of me on Facebook. That's terrible. Oh, Fatima, I was bullied in high school. Look how I turned out. It's all part of the American experience. Kids pick on people who are one day gonna rule the world. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. Barack Obama. That Muslim guy? <laughs> Show us what she did. Wait, is that a Photoshop picture of you? In a turban? Driving a taxi? That's outrageous. That is terrible. We are not Sikhs. Asif, I don't think that's what makes it so terrible. Fine, but if you're going to stereotype us, at least get it right. We don't wear turbans. It doesn't matter who she's bullying, Sikh, Muslim, it's all wrong. I'm going to call her parents up and have her come over and apologize. Mom, no, I'll be so embarrassed. Honey, I'm not going to embarrass you. It's not you I'm worried about. <laughs> Oh, come on. I asked your friend for one favor, and now I'm an embarrassment. You asked my best friend to pierce your tongue. Your mother loved it. Uh, 
Ew, TMI. Oh, sick. What? Honey, you have nothing to be ashamed of. This girl just needs to be taught a lesson. We are proud American Muslims. Not taxi driving Sikhs. <laughs> Okay, son, you're not helping. Guys, I just got the lead in the school production of The English Patient. <laughs> that movie sucked. <laughs> All right, so, um, so that's the first half of the first episode of Flaw in the Family. Um, so we developed this show. Um, obviously, Asif was lead creative on it and starred in it, and there are all these great actors in it, et cetera. Um, but we worked really closely with Muslim civil rights organizations um, to help us better understand like, what were the issues that they were actually working on and facing and challenges that the community had um, uh, in the work. Um, and, uh, and so we, you know, we, we had a call with them and with the creative team and sort of figured out what the issues were that we wanted to put in the episodes and then it was up to the writers to figure out how to do that well. Um, and it was a largely smooth process, although, um, Needs to say, this is an issue that um, not a lot of people do comedy about um, for, some, for some good reasons. And there were a lot of sensitivities, um, and this is something we could talk about later, but um, when you do comedy, especially with something like this, there's a lot of worry that like, oh, like you're portraying the community in a bad light, right? And what we want to do is portray them in a good light. And that's, that binary is not actually super helpful. Um, uh, in developing content that's going to be compelling, um, if all you think is your goal is like, oh, we want like positive depictions, whatever, you know, and then narrowly defining what positive means. So, um, but in any case, the issue that you saw sort of discussed in this episode, the top of the episode, was something that came up in our conversations, which is, you know, that people don't know the difference between Muslims and Sikhs, right? Which is. Um, you know, funny, but also tragic, right? The first person killed after 9-11 because of 9-11 was a, a Sikh man who was assumed to be Muslim. Um, and uh, again, we want to use humor to sort of uh, show this. And if you watch the rest of the episode, you can sort of see where, the, where, where we go with it. Um, but um, ultimately, uh, we thought um, that if we could both um, create something that uh, Muslim audiences would like, and we screened this uh, for Muslim audiences in cities um, all over the country, including high school students um, in particular, who loved it. Um, that would be uh, really powerful. But also, we wanted to send a message to Hollywood, right? Which um, uh, the Canadian show notwithstanding, the United States has never had a sitcom about a Muslim family. And so we wanted to demonstrate, like, this could be a TV show, right? Um, about a Muslim family, but also to give Asif a chance to go um, on every cable news show and on late night television, et cetera, and talk about the series, but talk about the lack of Muslim representation right, um, in, uh, 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 in television and the effect that that has on the way that Americans think about Muslims, right? And what are the depictions and, and where does that lead people? So um, the series, uh, we used Funny or Die as a distributor. Um, the series uh, was a success, but beyond the sort of viewing success of the series, we had uh, over 600 million media impressions for this, um, which is to say it got covered everywhere, right? And if you, for these groups that we worked with, there's nothing they could have done that would have gotten them that kind of media engagement, especially this kind of sort of positive um, engagement with Asif at the center of it. Um, all right, so the, my last example, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Stop. Great. Okay. So I'm out of time, apparently. Uh, but I'm just going to show a picture of it and talk about it briefly instead of showing the clip. Um, so the last example I was going to do is something I literally just finished last week, um, two weeks ago, whenever it was, uh, right before um, the high holidays. And um, this was a project that um, I did for Hillel International, which represents you know, students um, on campuses all over the country. Um, and they came to me with this... Um, challenge, they want to do a voter registration drive, et cetera. And what we ended up doing is creating a campaign called Meets Vote, which is a play on words. Um, uh, so Meets Vote, so everyone, I think most people know what a bar or bat mitzvah is, um, which is to say it's the ritual when you're 13, it's a coming of age ritual um, uh, in Judaism. Um, and they wanted to essentially create a ritual for becoming an adult uh, of 18 who can vote 
and to create uh, the idea that there should be ritual around vote um, and that it should be something to celebrate, right? So they wanted to borrow something from the sort of bar and bat mitzvah ceremony, um, which we really liked because, as I think was mentioned earlier, right, how many uh, rituals of other religions are you familiar with? Right, this is one of those, it's depending on where you live, but like you're much more likely actually gone into a synagogue because you're attending a bar or bat mitzvah, right, than you know, uh, uh, you know, other rituals which are often closed off or just family, et cetera. Um, but this one is for a whole community. So we developed this campaign. Oh, sorry, mitzvot is also the plural of mitzvah. Um, and in Judaism, there are 613 mitzvot, um, which are like commandments or obligations. Um, so the idea was also to, to sort of argue that voting should be considered right, an obligation um, um, uh, and almost like a religious obligation. So yeah, you can watch the video another time, but we have one of the characters in the video is a rabbi who sort of explains some of this. And the rest of the characters are just funny. So, okay, so uh, I'll stop there. Sorry for going over time, but thank you all for the questions. So I realize that we're actually already in the coffee break as I come to the stage. So um, I'll be even briefer than I intended. One quick correction to Sarah Bin's intro, because it'll get me in trouble if I don't do it. I'm not currently the dean of the Annenberg School. I'm actually currently the dean of Penn School of Social Policy and Practice. January 1st, I take over uh, Annenberg. So we're very careful. That yeah. starts well, Congratulations. No, I don't need to climb. Just want to make sure because we're, we're, we're videotaping. <laughs> um, also, it's not lost on I me. Mean, there's a little bit of a setup to go after a comedy guy like Nick and what he's doing. But um, I will say I'll eventually get to, and I, I will be brief, so that's good. I'll eventually get to how Sarah Bin framed what I wanted to say today. But I, I'm going to start by actually apologizing, in a sense, for being an anthropologist, which usually means a couple of different things. First, it means I'm often someone who feels like an interloper in most scenarios. We sort of really enjoy the role of the stranger, the outsider. Um, but the second thing we often tend to do is take things that might seem obvious and self-evident, um, but that aren't explicitly thematized, and just try to map them a little bit more emphatically. And so as a function of what I thought was an incredibly thoughtful and provocative, even inspiring at times keynote yesterday, I just want to reframe a little bit what I want the Black Hebrew Israelites to do in the context of this discussion. Um, because part of what I think I want to use, two examples, Hebrew Israelites and then one at the start that's really just a, a small plug for one of my upcoming projects, what I want them to do is maybe speak to what should be obvious, but I think still demands a kind of explicit invocation, which is that if we're going to have a discussion in the context of how audiences are constituted about media literacy and religious literacy, then it always seems to me, especially in the US context, although not even exclusively there, that we're also talking <coughs> about a certain version of how those convergences speak to religious and, and speak to racial literacy at the same time that there's a version of part of what we're always doing as we imagine the construction of religious subjectivities, identities, communities, and audiences that are always also about these baked in presuppositions we have about racialized religious identity. Again, I would say beyond the US, but especially in the US context. And for me, two fantastic examples to hold on to of what that means that also reminds us that part of the project for a lot of relatively minoritized communities is about trying to unlearn what kinds of literacy see most operative in the contemporary moment. So the first one is this guy who some of you might know, 19th century African-American spiritualist, mesmerist, sex magician named Pascal Beverly Randolph, who was born in 1825 um, in Five Points in New York. And I think he's a fascinating figure for a whole bunch of reasons, but Part of his claim to fame is that he's an individual who clearly, amongst a whole bunch of peers, spent a lot of time trying to think about the black body itself as a particular kind of religious medium. And so his claim to fame, amongst the several other things, is he would, as a medium, channel figures like Socrates and George Washington and have them rail against the injustices of slavery. 
Now, it wasn't just that he did this amongst a group of, I think, interesting spiritualists at the time. It wasn't even the fact that he's often responsible, or people claim he's one of the individuals most responsible for the U.S.'s transition from the kind of passivity of spiritualism to the more agentive, occultive moves that he helped to popularize in his time. But it was also that part of his project, I would argue, was clearly a project about trying to figure out what kind of media are black bodies themselves. Especially insofar as one of the things he constantly grappled with was his own potential racialization in US context. And so some of that meant, at times, claiming, erroneously, falsely, to be not black from downtown New York, but a <coughs> Middle Eastern mystic who came with powers from abroad. <coughs> He was also someone who was incredibly virtuosic in the way he performed this material. So not only was he a spirit medium and a sex magician, he used all kinds of interesting magic mirrors to do his work, but by most accounts, he was one of the most magnificent performers in this particular genre of public performance at the time. And so for me, he's a really useful way to think about all of the kinds of complicated intersections between religiosity and race in the context of politics and civic engagement. Because clearly, there's a version of his story that's all about our capacity to use seemingly irrational assumptions, projects, initiatives to talk to and speak to specifically political projects. In the US, the project of trying to deal with and push back against slavery in the US context. For me, there's a direct line in a way between Pascal Randolph's really important 19th century maneuvers and the work of a group of African-American expats who in about 1967 decided to sell everything they owned, mostly out of Chicago, buy Sears and Roebuck tents and move to first West Africa, Liberia, um, and then eventually the modern state of Israel, which they, which they re-geographize as Northeast Africa. And part of what for me is so fascinating about this community, other than the fact that when you look at the history of how they did this work, it's always really centrally a history about their incredibly sophisticated deployments of the media options at the moment. From pamphleteering in Chicago on the west and south side, to using local black press throughout the 60s and 70s to talk about their plight once they get to Liberia and then eventually when they get to Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli state and their, their reception to this migratory movement. But then also in the contemporary moment where a group of what was initially more like 400 emigres has eventually ballooned to close to 5,000. And not just on the Kfar in southern Israel where really their most known to be incredibly importantly based, but also on the five different continents all around the world that constitute the far-flung transnational network of this spiritual community. A community that both deploys media in really nuanced ways, but also theorizes media in very explicit, and I think fascinating kinds of ways too. So one of the first introductions I had to Hebrew Israelites thinking explicitly about media and mass mediation was their particular version of a critique of Hollywood, which for them is quite literally the wood used by witches and warlocks to cast spells. Right? That Hollywood, and they have an incredibly, I think, provocative way of unpacking, unearthing that history of the wood itself. But they use that then to speak not just to the propagandistic possibilities of Hollywood and that the films that come out of Hollywood, but also to try to talk about a kind of orthogonal reality for how to think through the power, the potency of Hollywood as a brand and the kind of films that come out of LA. And so that for them is really important. But then they also are quite committed to not just being really early adopters of new technologies, but really kind of nuanced and savvy redeployers of some of the things that I think most of us would imagine, either one, we take for granted, or that two, when we use them, we don't quite deploy them in quite the, I think, really incredibly committed and purposeful ways that the community does. So that's everything from um, using the newest iPhone technology to link members of the community all around the world. It's about being very active self-archivers of their journey. So two of the moments that 
became national in the US, but also international media moments for this community that I'll just flag before I sit down, um, are one when Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown visited the community um, not too long ago for a whole bunch of reasons. Part of what the community is invested in is not just a version of racial and religious literacy, but also health literacy. And so for them, the community, I tell people they're fascistically healthy. So every member of the community is vegan by fiat. Every other day is a no-salt day. There's mandatory exercise every day. I mean, this is, and this is a project they've evolved over time. So when they left in 1967, they didn't have this sense that health literacy and a, and a promotion of health and advocating for health in marginal communities would be so central to their larger religious project. But they came to recognize the inextricable links between those things. And so one of the ways in which they've become known in the US was to continue to talk about health, health literacy in the communities they left in the US. And Whitney Houston, when her family was dealing with the health scare on their end, used it as an opportunity to visit the Kifar. And what you'll find out is in that moment when Whitney Houston came, they did what they do when any African-American or American celebrity politician visits the community, which is they chronicled the entire experience. Hours and hours of coverage of not just Whitney and her entourage in the community in the Negev, but traveling all around Israel. And when you visit any one of the satellite communities around the world, you'll see the sort of core, the hub of those spaces are what they call these audiovisual truth commissions, audiovisual truth centers where they both record video from mainstream or um, independent media outlets all around the world, but also archive their own community's production of documentaries about the evolution of their society and their cultural um, ways. And so part of what, for me, is interesting about that moment is it does begin, I think, to demonstrate the capacity of this community to really try to understand and unpack not just this kind of mythical version of Hollywood as this sort of ogre, this terrifying witchcraft-like um, powerful instantiation of being able to cast spells on a larger society, but also really incredibly committed, rationalized approach to making sure they document what they're doing, how it's changing over time, and using that to make sure as different communities around the world have different experiences in the local situated context, they're trying to have a common language, community set of media-based symbols to link them all together at the same time. The second thing they're often famous for in a mass media um, context is they're a community that when they left Chicago was always incredibly invested in musicality. So much so that one of their projects had been to redefine musical notation. So, so for the Hebrew Israelites, part of their argument is that nothing's innocent, right? There's nothing innocuous. And so that everything they learned about religion, everything they learned about race, everything they learned about mass mediation in the US before they left has to be explicitly unlearned. And for them, that includes the ways in which you write, you produce, music. And so the entire community happened to be really overrepresented by Chicago-based jazz and blues artists when they <clears> left. <throat> jazz and blues continued to be what sustained them all throughout their travels. So they would have members tour first West Africa, then Europe, to bring money, send money back to the community when they were struggling as they initially left. And to this day, they continue to think about music as central to their emigrationist project and to their recasting of what race and religion should be in the contemporary moment. So much so that if you visit the community, realize most of the young people who've never been to the United States, right, who might sound like you know, they're from the south side of Chicago with their Hebrew um, and their Arabic, but they've only been to southern Israel, also incredibly masterful musicians and use that musicianship to help not just proselytize and spread the word about what they do, but also to interface more effectively with the larger Israeli and global community. And so there have been many occasions when individuals from the community do things like become very competitive on Israel's version of American Idol, um, both as a way to differently profile the seemingly opaque, bizarre rituals of this community, but also in a way that helps to get them integrated into the kind of multi-everything, multi-ethnic, multicultural um, 
version of the Israeli society that they've been committed to and that they've continued to integrate into in complicated ways over the last 45 years or so. The, my, my final point before I sit down is that one of the things that also becomes central to the discussion, both I think of Pascal Randolph, and I'm hoping, the reason why that's more of a plug than anything else is that I'm hoping to be able to make my next project some version of a film and a one-man show about Randolph and, and what he did and how he did it, because he's relatively underappreciated in the literature. Um, and the Hebrew Israelites, what connects those two is that this discussion about the kind of embeddedness, the intrinsic relationship, the inextricable link between religious literacy and racial literacy also, of course, begs the question about things like sex and gender as well. And you see in both of those instances, such a powerful, even uncanny commitment to thinking and unthinking sex gender at the same time. So for someone like Randolph, it was his incredibly purposeful commitment to everything from the free love movement um, to his specific investment in teaching people about sexuality in ways that allowed them to embrace their own, especially women, to embrace their own sort of sexual agency in newfangled ways, which is, of course, it's radical now, definitely radical in the 19th century in a place like New York City. But also the Hebrew Israelites have this very complicated commitment to versions of gender identity that for them are overdetermined in a lot of ways by their history in the US, but also by their appreciation of how sometimes foreign and unexpected their own religious and spiritual um, leanings might be. And so they're responding both to assumptions about African American Christianity, right, that clearly it doesn't even seem to make sense to think about black folks and Hebrewism or Israelite identity as somehow interconnected, um, especially given the stereotype presuppositions we have about black folks always trafficking in Christianity. But they also then, at the very same time, are recognizing that when you look at how they, in their own cultural world, seem to operationalize their version of Hebrew Israelite identity, which is often just predicated on a, a particular kind of, I think, savvy, but literal reading of the Old and New Testament. It's so incredibly oversaturated with what would feel like incredibly constrained notions of gender and sexuality. Um, so the entire community has always been patrilineal, um, both in New York and Philadelphia and in Israel. But there's also this version of how they think about gender roles within the family and the community that would be obvious to someone in the US as seemingly reflections or extensions of some of the most antiquated presuppositions we have about gender differences in communities that clearly seem to be, I think, obvious versions of how black Christian subjects get marked as gendered and sexual beings as well. But they do it in a way, I think, that also demonstrates a kind of explicit reflexivity, a recognition that one of the things they have to figure out a way to do as they reimagine how to think about race and religion together in their own deployment of new media technology is that to get this right, they have to navigate this terrain such that at the end of the day, the skeptics, and there are tons of skeptics in the black community they left behind, tons of skeptics in Israel, that the skeptics don't simply place them into the categories of black reactionary religious difference that they know, that they presume, people would slot them in to begin with. And so what you see when you look at their media productions and they're constantly making films and writing books and trying to think about how to use different genres and platforms to tell people about how they conceptualize the links between religion and race. That their project is one that says, how do we get people to see things that otherwise they can't see because of all of the real clear assumptions they bring to the screen before we get there. For me, and I, I'll sit down on this note, for me that meant for the first maybe five or 10 years I was working on the community, even as a filmmaker myself, I would never show images or video of the group. Partly because I felt like most people who would look at that material, because there's something so incredibly thick and saturated in the visual image, wouldn't be able to see the kinds of cultural practices they did, the way they operationalized their investment in religion, and race, and politics in ways that would do anything other than reinforce their own assumptions, their stereotypes about what the community represents as a racialized group in the US. And so part of what I'm trying to figure out in the contemporary moment is how do we get ourselves to recognize that even as we're seeing what we think to be religiously constituted audiences, communities, 
that those religiously constructed subjectivities are always at the very same time completely non-understandable, completely opaque to us without a concomitant recognition of the fact that the only way we get at and to notions of religious difference, religious difference, notions of religious identity, is by recognizing that they're always already connected to, entangled with, um, really in complicated ways we enforce by the presuppositions we have about how the race and gendered and sexualized religious subjects were already there to begin with, and to try to tease that out in ways that might allow us, in some small way, to unlearn ourselves what we think we already know about how to write these religious communities, think these religious communities, screen and film these religious communities into existence. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. I want to first give um, our speakers a chance to uh, ask questions of each other if they have any before we open to the audience. <laughs> Expectant looks. <laughs> I think we're good. You good? Yeah. Okay. All right. We've had a lot today. Who would like to lead us off? I have a question for Mr. Jackson. Uh, what's the interaction or the connection? Can you wait for the mic, please? Oops. What is the connection or interaction between that group and the Falashas? Is there any? So they will tell you that, as far, as far as they know, the Ethiopian Jews have been told by the Israeli state to stay away from them. Um, whether that's true or not, their substantive relationships on the ground aren't, with, aren't usually with Ethiopian Jews. Actually, most of the sustained contact and community they built in the community are with sort of local Israelis in, um, in the south but also with um, Arab Muslims and African Bedouin in the Negev Desert. And so those are folks they built homes for. So they learned to build homes when they got to Liberia as best they could and took those skills with them to the desert and used them when the Israeli state wanted to make sure they could find the Bedouin nomads, used those skills to help build community homes for them. And so those are the folks, if you go visit the community, they'll take you to see sort of the Palestinians they know, they'll take you to see um, the African Bedouin there won't be any African, uh, any Ethiopian Jews that'll be on that itinerary. Although, you know, their project is a project that says to be an Israelite is al already to be African, right? That Israel is a part of Africa. So for them, at least at the symbolic level, Ethi Ethiopian Jews are incredible evidence for the veracity, the veracity of their own claims. Um, what do y'all think about, um, particularly Mick, uh, issues of access? Like a lot of the ways in which we consume media today are, you know, our, our audiences are very, very, very diversified and people get to choose what they want. We've heard this over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and so issues of paywalls or subscriptions or, you know, if, if one of our projects is to try to leverage the power of media to help with <laughs> religious literacy, how do we deal with this piece of, of access? Um, it's a great question. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll speak to sort of two different elements of that. One that's been an issue um, that we've dealt with directly, my agency and our clients, is you know, we'll get hired by a nonprofit organization that's working on an issue or we'll work with a nonprofit. Um, and the question of distribution comes up. And, you know, the one of the things that's happened over the last couple of years is, you know, early web video space um, was this the, the idea that you could, anyone could create a video and build an audience for it with very little money 
right, was the, the, the idea was that like, wow, this is gonna revolutionize, you know, both from a creator standpoint, but also from a consumption standpoint. And I think that was true for a while, um, but what Facebook did um, when they got into the video business was to really change the game. And for folks who work in comedy, a number of the primary uh, producers of uh, comedy video for the web have gotten out of the business um, because Facebook has made their model unsustainable. They can't make money. Um, Facebook basically took a lot of people off of YouTube, um, brought them to Facebook, and now they charge you for distribution, and a lot of people don't have money for distribution. So that's one problem. Um, the other, which is a different issue, but is, is a, another audience challenge is the, you know, whatever in the 70s when the original All in the Family was on, you know, the tens of millions of people would watch single shows, right? So you had a, an environment in which, um, you know, you could reach the whole country, you know, uh, more or less with a single show. And uh, now the most popular shows have a fraction of the audience, right? So the good news is niche shows can be a success right, with many fewer viewers, which means that communities that maybe weren't represented as much can create a hit show and they don't have as high a bar. The problem is you, you don't have the same diversity of audience um, because of the bifurcation, and that has its own set of challenges. If I could add something. I'm not sure if this is on. Um, uh, I, I also, to add to that, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of streaming. Um, I spoke with a young female director uh, last week, uh, the director of First Match, if anyone has seen that on Netflix. Um, I believe it came out this summer. And um, she's a female director. This is her first film that she's directed and, and written. Um, and the lead is a young black woman. And because Hollywood is the way it is, that never would have been a blockbuster. Um, but she expressed to me that she doesn't think this film would have been made uh, if it ha hadn't been for streaming. And Netflix and other streaming services have, you know, as you mentioned, really created spaces due to algorithms that we can see things that, that fit our interests. Does, do Netflix and Hulu have prices and monthly fees? Absolutely, so there is an access issue there. But um, it is interesting how we've seen kind of the, um, the industry kind of open up like that. Hello, and thank you all for, for the wisdom of that, that you've shared. I was particularly taken by the, the um, phrase imagined realities and being immersed in an imagined reality. And I'm wondering if people are always aware that they're in an imagined reality. And I, I'm thinking, I'm, I hope I'm not gonna offend anyone, but I'm thinking of Fox News <laughs> and you know, should in 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 a new way as an imagined reality that has people wow. in ca and I wonder if anyone would care to comment on that. Am I understanding what you're? Yeah, I think um, what I was referring to is a process um, that's sometimes referred to as transportation into the narrative to be immersed in a narrative to be engaged in a narrative. That's a very provocative question, whether people realize that whether when they are in, in some sort of uh, essentially a nar a narrative of, of what's going on, whether it is a uh, one that's the accuracy, the whole issue of fake news and these kind of things. I have never thought of that idea, but um, there's no reason. Yeah, there's no reason that that wouldn't work in, the, in sort of a similar way. Particularly if you're never challenged, right? If you're the problem with segmentation of news um, uh, is is one of the problems that became you know the hardly the, this audience for the uh, the what we call the traditional broadcast networks are or the legacy broadcast networks has plummeted and everyone is now uh, essentially listening to what they want to hear, right? On the news channel of their choice, and so it becomes easy to sustain. If, if all you're hearing is this uh, version of reality, you know, you're not gonna be challenged often. I think it's also the case that audiences are attracted to 
news and sources of information that can confirm their sort of pre-existing notions, right? So people, we're all sort of drawn to those sort of narratives, right? And we all sort of self-curate our, our, our Twitter feeds and our, our news feeds and so on. In, in terms of your question about do people know that they're being, <laughs> that they're immersed in a fictional world, I think people do know that, you know, when they're immersed in like uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings books or films or Harry Potter, when you ask them, they, they do know that it's a fictional world. You know, they say, of course I know it's a fictional world. On the other hand, they also do talk about the enjoyment that they get from the imaginative, maybe loss of self or escape into that world. And they also do talk about, um, they do talk about those worlds as real in some sense and as meaningful and as, as spaces that, um, although they'll deny that they're real spaces, they will say you know, things that like, um, you know, these, these worlds, I want to believe they're real. Um, and that they, they give me meaning and they give me direction in my life. Um, and you'll even have people talking about bringing these books with them to the hospital, you know. Um, and so, so <laughs> I guess the answer is yes, they know they're not real, but it's much, I think it's much more complicated. The, the imaginative immersion is so appealing. Um, and it, I think it does become real. I mean, certainly for children it is real, right, too. There's a whole developmental um, dimension to what you're talking about. Um, um, yeah, so. Uh, so one, one more brief thing. How do the mics go on? Oh, there they are. Um, the, the, I, I think there's three ways of thinking of this, right? There's, you know, when you mentioned about the exorcist and people having this physical reaction, it reminded me sort of going backwards, very early film, right, when people would be in there and they would see these things on the screen. Right? And the, the, you know, what new technologies can be, um, uh, can create an alternative reality and, and um, I was actually going to ask you about alternative reality, um, uh, you know, um, where technology again has created these immersive environments where you really feel like you're there. Um, the second is is the narrative piece, which I think you were speaking to a bit, right? Which is a, when there's a storyline, right? And that's you know, with science fiction, it's a whole world, right? But um, but that's immersive in a different way. But the the Fox News way, it which is uh, is that they, they create a, a factual reality, right? Like they're the the things they say the same things over and over and over again, so that you believe a certain set of things um, that aren't true, right? Um, because you know they're repeated to you. But the um, the intention that's the intention of Fox News um, to do that to you, and and to do it to you without you feeling like it's an alternative reality. Um, that it's just reality. So it's interesting sort of looking at those side by side by side because um, I think there are some important similarities. And I, last, I've, Fox understands its role as entertainment, right? Which is one of the, I mean, those, for folks who study that, that's one of the reasons why it's good because it's entertaining. Like people just want to keep watching it and watching it and watching it. And a lot of other news shows uh, are not particularly entertaining. Um, I want to jump in with um, an observation in relation to what both Sheila and Chris were saying. I think that there are multiple, I can only think of two off the top of my head, but interesting recent sort of material um, evidence of this process by which we enter into these imagined, uh, imagined realities and then carry something out of meaning from them, which then um, becomes currency in our world. And I think of um, two things, one of which is a comment, uh, I can't remember her whole name, Evan Wood, the, one of the lead actresses in uh, Westworld, was called to testify um, around some Me Too stuff before Congress, I believe. And she spoke in an interview about wearing the necklace that her character wears in the movie, and her, in the TV show, and for those of you who know it, this is a character who experiences incredible trauma throughout the narrative and that she has sort of anchored herself and her own narrative and orientation in the world and drawn the strength to speak about these issues within her own actual lived experience in front of Congress by way of the necklace of the character that she plays. The other one that I think is symbolically interesting is the uh, prevalence now of the Star Wars resist symbol on clothes and on cars, not as a sign of fandom or, um, or allegiance to the force, but as an anti-Trump 
um, resist symbol or a, a stance against the contemporary uh, political order. And I think it's another example of where the sort of immersion in a media context has provided an orientation that then is readable to the public with respect to our lived reality. Maybe the only thing I would add is I would make a distinction between maybe the ways in which we can think about how we distinguish between what we think is real and what we imagine to be imagined, right? So imagine somehow is unreal versus the recognition that part of what we do as a species is imagine our world into existence, right? So, so to just presume that the only way to understand that dichotomy is as imaginative is somehow different from real is to underestimate, I think, the extent to which all of what we think of as real, in a sense, we imagine into existence in a way that shouldn't be read or understood in a disparaging or dismissive way, but is an inescapable way to talk about how we produce those societies that we are a part of, even as we tend to then, after the fact, seem to declare that they were here before we got here and we had no role in making them. Okay, with that, we're gonna have to stop and we'll take a very, very, very short coffee break <laughs> and return for the second panel and do a little time adjustment because we are over time. But, we're, but we wanna thank, I'm sorry, we wanna thank all of you.